Thank you very much for inviting me for this wonderful session. And then there will be question at the end. Opportunity to tell Africa experience in a new way. Research and writing go hand in hand. Without research, there can be no good writing. And without good writing, the research already done would never be known as a research. Note, researchers should take all forms of writing seriously. Then number two, personal journey as research writer. Either you are writing for the book or you are writing for the people or you are, you are talking in events or a, a breakthrough or challenges. Here's number two again, some writings which I have done, like you can see the Moy the Deaf Girl, Mystery of Unknown, Globalization and Peace Security in Africa, what it means globalize Africa security. They'll kill us tonight. Say you are one of them. 30 years down line on AIDS. Tribute to the death of Margaret Ogola, a great Kenyan writer. The meaning of life, time life. Putting pressure on, on Sudan and National Catholic Reporter and Independence News Weekly. So, when we are doing some writing, you become serious researcher should master the different genres to communicate their research, even think of crafting, crafting stories because Africans learn on a lot through storytelling. E.g. things fall apart. A well-known research novel full of proverbs. What inspire reading in the field? One, you can get the research topic easily. Two, you learn also how to express your research by imitation, argument, and the structures. A can proverbs from a can from West Africa, Ghana, as a proverb, we say, when you follow in the path of your father, you learn to walk like him. This highlight the importance of listening to the elders in your field. Three, you can get, you can get to build a network on peop, of people you can cite for your research. Those whose ideas are similar or attract your, you, including your supervisor or editors. Four, you remain relevant in the field. Five, you avoid repeating research or article for publication which others have done. Note, you cannot separate reading from serious research and research writing. Writing generally itself. Then grammar, some challenges today. That's the number three, some challenges today. Writing generally itself, grammar, descriptive writing, introduction and research finding, research methodology. Evaluation writing, summarize and literature review. Persuasive introduction and conclusion. Argumentation writing, literature review and discussion. A problem of education system. Mentorship, writing by imitation. Grant and funding, writing for who? policymaker or journal publishing politics. Note, a researcher should be above, should above average in advanced grammar and argumentation and be ready to know the publishing politics. How, how to stay and improve research writing? One, grammar and essay writing skill. Begin with updating your grammar. Serious writing is found in paragraphs, in paragraphing elements. Paragraph tell the reader about the quality of the arguments and focus in research. 
paragraph show how the author relate with other writers' idea and argument, arguments. Varied length, short, emphasize, long, more than a half a page, medium. Note, if you are not yet prof proficient in grammar and dictation, it will dict diction, it's worth investing in good books to help you. Four, stay improved in research writing continues. Two, relating arguments and evidence, having an argument developed from the research, playing with evidence. Two, what question can be answered by the researchers? or what question can be raised from the researcher that have not been, not been done before. The argument should come from the theoretical framework or of the field of researcher. Summary, good, researcher, good research writer should establish the relationship between an argument and evidence from their research, whether it is empirical or secondary source. Then third, signposting. Even when the argument is established, the writer needs to take readers through the step they have reason through to come up with this argument. Without signposting, the reader will just abandon your writing. Think again of topic sentences at the beginning of the paragraph as important for research writing. Research writing is not concealed as in prose writing, where the plot is hidden. Not always tell your reader where you are going with your writing. For novelty excitement, a thoughtful research, research can lead to insight in the field. Research writing does not have to be dull. New understanding new theory, new concepts, new area for further researching, new knowledge, proverbs. Be creative as researcher, writer, experiment with word, play with words. Stay improving continuous, five disseminating research to who? and audiences. A new idea likely to be published by traditional journal, books, publisher, newspaper, etc. Can a junior scholar develop groundbreaking idea that influence policy? Learn the art of getting published. Look for conferences where the ideas may be welcome. Blog, blog, and tweet. Note, who will listen to the ideas? Otherwise, it's useless doing endless research. Researchers should also be free to write what they want, even if only few will listen, but play the game of publishing. Opportunities in civilian protection. We have Southern Sudan, Ethiopia, Cameroon, Nigeria, then to kidnapping, famine, climate, refugees, cause of war, civil wars in Africa, cause of terrorism. What is relevance of dialogue in this area about? Think of a niche where you can make a couple of publication before moving to the next area. What are the area innovative innovation in writing? For example, use proverb. Use proverb to spice the writing. Proverbs are like theories in Africa. Three, they have hidden community wealth of knowledge. Four, they are culturally intelligence of the wise people. Kipsigis, proverb. Father and son are one. Mother and daughter are one. A can proverb, when a woman is hungry, she says, Rust, she, just a moment. I can proverb when a woman is angry, she says, ask something for the children. 
that they may eat. Ibo is stupid fly follow the corpse to grave. Conclusion, research writing is a craft from the beginning of the research to its publication, it is a process. It has to engage the readers. Academic writing should not just be dry, it should tell story that transformatory and seek differences. Outlet, blogs, journal, books, tweet, keep sensitivity at all time. Look at the innovative of research writing and publishing. Thank you for listening. Good afternoon, everyone. I trust that everybody else is well. Today, we were going to cover research writing. And um, I, I was talking to Ludovica a little earlier today and just mentioning the fact that, man, this would have been a very interesting one if we had it face to face, um, so that I could give you uh, examples of, uh, of, of, of my writing, uh, the before and after, you know, the, the initial drafts and then. Uh, um, uh, what is it called? Um, uh, seven, seven versions down the line when the managing editor finally says, okay, <laughs> you can have it. <laughs> I mean, uh, we, 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 we think we're in a good enough shape. Um, you know, that trajectory would have been a very interesting one to see uh, uh, how these ideas move along. Uh, because interestingly, you know, um, as whatever proposal you write, um, as whatever paper you write, um, goes through the, por the process, uh, there are different bits and pieces that, uh, that will be picked up. Um, I am aware, of course, that um, there are a number of us here, um, like uh, 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 Ngala yourself and, 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 and Berit and uh, Katya, who've written quite a bit. So I, uh, uh, I am in the unenviable position of uh, preaching to the choir on one hand, and then uh, probably um, introducing new concepts on the other hand. So let's see if we'll be able to, to, to strike that balance. Uh, for those to whom I'll be preaching, you know, be kind enough uh, to take it as a recap <laughs> or a revision session. Um, for those for whom the subject is, is reasonably new, uh, don't be afraid to, you know, interject at any point and ask any questions. Or as uh, Rosemary was saying earlier, you know, we could, uh, you know, uh, jot whatever issues or questions that we have somewhere, and then uh, we engage, uh, we engage um, at the tail end. Unfortunately, today's session then uh, with, the, with, the, with the challenges that we're having will end up being more like a, a, um, a how do you say, like a lecture and discussion series, but um, I hope that uh, we will still be able to get something out of it. Now, I decided to focus this on the proposal uh, stage because this is where uh, I believe most of us with regards to this project are actually at. I know um, a number of us have already been asked to, you know, we've already sent in uh, our initial ideas as to the uh, research themes and questions that we want to engage in. Um, Katya uh, and, and, and team are probably waiting for us to then submit. Um, our proposals. So maybe, maybe this is a, uh, the right time to be discussing this. Um, but suffice it to say, and uh, drawing on what you might have already seen from, uh, from what Katia center, centers, there are quite a number of ways in which, you know, um, research proposals can be written, okay? Um, either way, they will be interested to capture at a very minimum the context within which you want to carry out the research, uh, the gap that you have seen within that context that you think you know your research can be able to help to fill, the specific question you'll be addressing yourself towards, um, and the objective of the study, and then, of course, how you intend to approach uh, the answering of that question, and uh, what others would say would be the importance of, of addressing that question. You know, the so what question. You know, once we are done with your research, 
once we get the output from it and when we read it. So what is going to change in the world? Okay. But the specifics of how it is written is going to vary. Uh, Prof. Sangala mentioned that, uh, you know, when you're sending in a, a manuscript or a proposal idea uh, for a book chapter, it's going to be very different as from when you are sending to uh, 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 Professor Barrett, uh, you know, uh, an idea that she could find from uh, her Safer Spaces, you know, uh, uh, umbrella budget, and which will be different from when uh, you are trying out uh, your hand at writing an academic paper uh, for publication in a journal, all right? So each of these outlets are likely to have um, their own proposal outlines. And that is a fact that is important to remember because as we close towards the tail end, one of the key things that uh, I would want to add and which quite a number of people overlook is that you, we tend to approach uh, proposal writing in a very cookie cut approach. We approach it in the way that we have been taught or in the way that has been successful for most of us. And we forget to, is it cross the I's and dot the T's or whatever it is that the Brits tell us? Or is it the Americans? Okay, and which is to make sure that whatever we are presenting conforms to what is expected of us by the person asking for the research proposal. All right. Now, having said that, then let's see some of the details. Okay, key things, key things that any kind of uh, research proposal would want to uh, you to address. Okay, would be your research problem and your research question. Okay. What is it that you are engaging yourself in? Okay, what is the specific question that you want to address? Okay, and when you are thinking around that research problem, you know, there, there's a technique around how you can be able to, to bring it to fruition. Okay, and that is where I am putting in the comment that a problem exists from up close and, up, and, and from afar. Okay. So you are drawing us in, you can say, for example, in the context of the study that we are, uh, of the project that we are all engaged in here, is an issue of uh, an armed civilian protection or civilian protection, you know, broadly. Then from civilian protection, which has both an armed and an, an armed component, we are honing in on an armed civilian protection. But where is this happening? It is happening within conflict or post-conflict settings where in the world we have selected a couple. We have uh, uh, those of us who are engaging in, the, in Asia, and then we have part of this project that is here, and so on and so forth. So, you know, you, 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 you bring us from this global issue so that you, you show us that whatever you are dealing with is at once trivial. It is close enough whom, okay? It is close enough to me by it being an issue that, uh, we experience in Mandera or West Pokot or whatever, or in South Sudan, but it is also a global issue. Okay, so this is the idea. Um, then uh, the research proposal also must deal with, uh, with the, your proposed answer. You, you need to be able to uh, indicate to us what kind of hypothesis, what, what kind of angle are you taking uh, in this? Okay, and uh, do you think that this approach that you're taking towards the answering of the research question is going to lead us to Canon, is going to lead us to, you know, uh, an answer that we can be able to confidently stand behind, okay, and make uh, uh, subsequent policy decisions or otherwise on, okay? Uh, a research proposal will also uh, uh, need to address uh, the idea of, uh, of your research design, how you are going to collect the data uh, and analyze that data. Uh, and then finally, um, how you anticipate uh, us to make use of uh, the study findings, okay? So these are not the only elements, but they are the elements that are at a minimum one would expect to see in a research proposal. So let's get into a little bit of the detail in each of these four areas, okay? So what is a research problem? Uh, simply put, it is a problem that is, you know, uh, about which we don't know enough, but it is possible for us to find out, okay? 
um, the problems don't just exist out there. There's nothing that tells you that, okay, uh, here I am, this is a problem, you need to study me, you know, and I'm civilian protection, don't forget me, don't just study about hunger and famine and other things, no, okay? Um, it is something that comes from your experience, whether that experience has been a visit that you have made somewhere, whether that experience has been something that you have read or something that you have gleaned, you know, from, um, from a conversation. Uh, it could be something that you have observed. And on the basis of that observation, which triggers thinking in you, you you're beginning, you, you, you start getting into this process of sort of uh, 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 thinking, okay, so is there an issue here? Um, and what is it? And why hasn't it been dealt with? Is it because people don't know enough? Can I be able to be to help in trying to determine, you know, or, 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 or um, uh, the causes behind this, or uh, part of the team that provides a little bit of clarity so that something can get done about this? Okay. Now, as we are thinking through this, okay, you can see several things are happening right there. Okay, it is, uh, there's a little bit of bias because, uh, you know, by the time you're identifying something as a problem, it is because in your mind, you have this image of an ideal situation, okay? Or you have in your mind some kind of hypothesis as to how things should be, okay? So you will see a starving child and you say, nobody in this day and age should die of hunger. And then you start asking yourself, but then why is this one dying of hunger, okay? What is causing an issue here? So there's a little bit uh, of a bias. It is imaginary because at that point in time, you have actually not gone into the data to verify that uh, famine, drought, or whatever it is, 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 is an issue, okay? It is trivial because at that point in time, it is concerning only you, okay? So that is where, uh, how that happens. So how does one identify a researchable problem? Okay, many ways. I've already given a, a sampling of this. We can identify these problems through observations, through conversations, through reading. For those of us who are in the academic uh, uh, um, arena, um, usually, uh, not usually, but commonly, uh, some of us, uh, uh, you know, in the course of our reading, uh, academic papers, the last section usually has recommendations, some of which would be recommendations for further study. Uh, gaps that um, somebody else has identified as having been thinly studied or that remain intriguing, you know, on the basis of those findings. That's a rich source of information. So, you know, literature reviews, some of them could come from reading just grey literature, you know, magazine articles, periodicals, um, uh, pieces put out by NGOs working in particular sectors that raise interesting things. And we dig a little bit behind that, okay? Uh, sometimes we get researchable problems uh, from those whose work, uh, you know, revolve around that particular area. And so they would come out with a call where they're asking us to respond, you know, or conduct research in a particular area, you know? Uh, so that would come. Now, as you think through a problem that you, as an individual or your institution can you know, sort of get its hands dirty in terms of researching. Um, you need to consider a few things. Eh? There are many problems uh, in this world, uh, some big, some not so big, okay? Uh, the basic idea here is that you want to choose one that you can manage within whatever constraints you are given, okay? So if I just draw to the, our own experiences, uh, you know, in the last couple of weeks, we have budgetary constraints. Why? Because, um, you know, um, the, uh, the, the research of financial partner uh, uh, back in the UK, you know, for reasons well known to all of us, um, has had to slash the pass. Okay. And if they've done that, then so we have a limitation. There's only so much that we can be able to do um, with such a pocket. So despite the fact that there could be many interesting problems to study, with regards to an armed civilian protection in the East African region, we already have a limitation. So we don't go for those problems that require a lot of resources, maybe in terms of equipment or facility, 
or, or facilities or in terms of finances because we cannot afford them. There's also the issue of time. Before we knew we would be able to run this over such a long period of time. So we would have taken a big problem, sliced it and diced it um, you know, uh, into manageable pieces, okay? And then done each of these individually and then put everything together to make it uh, a wholesome uh, study. But now, uh, because of the shortening of the time frame, then there's only so much that one can do. So even as you're thinking about a problem that you can research, okay? Um, we will want many things, but we can only do so much based on, uh, on these uh, ideas, okay? Now, the second bit, okay? Um, how do we then write this problem statement part? Because this is critical because it is what will convince the person holding the past treatment that they need to release money, okay? To us in order for us to be able to do that study, okay? So in developing the problem statement, um, what, most of us would encourage is to do this in a sort of like a funnel approach. Provide a context for the problem, but do it in, a, in an organized manner. Draw me. Um, you can start with the, either a personal story or a personal experience, and then you quickly move me from that triviality to showing me that this is actually could be uh, 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 exemplary of a global phenomenon or a much bigger problem, okay? And then, you know, you sort of, we move from that space and we come all the way down to the particular issue uh, that requires uh, 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 attention, okay? And so as you do that, okay? As you do that, we will need, we'll need you as you draw us in. You sort of cannot leave us hanging, okay? So some... Uh, some of the things, you know, uh, some of the ways in which you can do that is how you play around with what, okay? Uh, Ngala has already talked to us about proverbs, so I'm not going to give any, but there are a couple of phrases there that we could be able to, to, to make use of, you know, in order to, 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 to make this uh, actually work well for us. So, you know, you could either say, look, um, whereas, you know, um, this is known, okay? Maybe whatever has been studied has been, you know, um, either missed out something or put things together that shouldn't have been put together, you know, or have been done in contexts that were, uh, uh, um, you know, significantly different from the context that you want to, to study in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know? Um, if it is something that is contentious, but something that is well known, well studied, but is contentious, you can bring up things like this, okay? Now, um, the entirety of you creating this context about the problem is for you to be able to come to a position or bring us to a position where you're able to expose the gap. You're able to expose that thing that you want to, 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 to study uh, specifically. So if you marry uh, the statements that I have just shown you previously here, you know, it is known that, you know, or researchers have demonstrated blah, blah, blah. And then you bring it here. What remains unknown is, Okay, or despite the efforts of those researchers, there still remains a, you know, a shortage of literature or a paucity of literature in X. Okay, you know, or what this theory does not explain is X. Okay, so you see in that way, you have clearly, you know, sort of like situated whatever you want to do within a global conversation, within a conversation of uh, interested researchers or practitioners. And then at the same time, having drawn them in, having convinced them that you're actually speaking the same language, you're telling them, but wait a minute, guys, there is something here that we don't know very well, okay? And so that is what brings us there. And if you do that well, it should be able to bring us to an aha moment, okay? Sometimes, not always, depending on the, on the word count, okay? If you're able to manage that very well, you can also go ahead and tell us the, 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 you know, the consequences of not filling in that gap. So in this case, for example, we could say, look, um, we have addressed many issues around uh, uh, unarmed civilian protection. However, we may not necessarily have considered, you know, uh, the impact or the effect of uh, 
the silent majority, the bystanders, okay? Those who take on a, much, a more passive role as opposed to those who don't do that. And uh, if we do not address this, okay, then maybe this is a resource that could have helped tilt the scale, okay? And da, 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 da. so in a sense, you know, you, you, you sort of can be able to bring that in, the consequence of not filling in the gap, okay? If, if, if it allows. Now, be careful, okay? Be careful of these common problems, okay? There are instances where people will, um, state the problem as a solution. Uh, in that sense, they're already um, indicating their bias in the study, okay? Um, there are many instances where people state problems in very vague terms or in very abstract terms. So you really struggle to see exactly, you know, um, what is going to be studied there, you know. Um, so yeah, these are some ideas um, as presented here that um, should be able to, to help us get on the right footing. Please, please, please remember that it is not enough just to say that, uh, you know, this is something that has received little research. Um, if we had time, I would have shown you uh, uh, that interesting uh, uh, study there, but maybe you can be able to, to Google it, and then you'll see what this guy writes about. It's sort of like a, a tongue-in-cheek uh, article, and uh, it is aimed at addressing the not-yet-done-in-here syndrome, where we take studies from elsewhere and we copy-paste them, we take studies that uh, Berit has already done in Myanmar, in Philippines, in uh, Timor-Leste or wherever. And then we, we say, oh, but this thing has not been done in uh, Juba. You know, uh, that road doesn't lead us very far. Okay. Uh, that road doesn't lead us very, very far. Now, let's move away from the problem to the question and uh, to the second element. And this is the research question. Um, a question, a research question is really, uh, it's really the focus of your research. This is, this is the key thing, okay? In fact, this is the fulcrum around which the entire proposal is going to revolve around. If the research question is clear, okay, the person who's reviewing your research proposal is likely to forgive you on a few things and help you to panel beat a few things. Okay, now a good research question starts with a capital letter and ends with a question mark. Okay, um, it's not a statement of fact. Okay, um, it should be a question that can lead to uh, an answer that could be, you know, yeah, uh, plus, minus, blah, blah. You know, the, the, the answer could be anything. Okay, um, it is not a yes, no kind of thing. No, that is not the idea. Okay. In that sense, therefore, it must be uh, researchable. So as I've just mentioned, the purpose of the entire research is really to answer the research question. Okay. Um, this research question needs to be connected to the problem. Okay. Which is why we started with the problem. It must be open to alternative solutions. It is not predetermined, okay? It should not be too general because if it is too general, it, it, is, it, it introduces an element of vagueness. So, you know, if somebody wants to find out, is television a bad influence? Uh, what exactly about television? The physical gadget? The number of hours one watches? The type of program one watches? the time one watches it. So what exactly about television? And when you say a bad influence, influence on what? And what exactly is bad? Okay. Um, it should also be something, not be something that you cannot answer. You know, uh, some of these things are very ethereal, you know, uh, they're up here. Okay. Like why do people suffer? I mean, how are you going to answer that question? We know people suffer when there is armed conflict, yes. Uh, but trying to answer that is a, is, is, is a road with no end, okay? Um, 
it should also not be a question that is geared towards optimality, you know, because we see the world in very different lenses. And trying to do a question that leads you to the best option or best choice um, leads you, uh, is highly likely to lead you uh, to uh, a confirmation bias, okay? And that is also the same case, like, um, you know, uh, drafting a question that is uh, more or less uh, preordained, you know? Um, either uh, they are advocative in nature or they have, uh, you know, uh, presumed solutions, so they present presumed models, okay? Or uh, they only give you an option to say yes or no, okay? So these questions are not interesting. So because of the importance of the research question, okay, once you have crafted it, it is important to keep on visiting and revisiting it to make sure that you refine it. And this one I borrowed from uh, uh, this article from Farouji and colleagues, okay? And by refine here, um, they use this as a mnemonic um, and an acronym. Uh, where RE stands for relevance, uh, F for feasible, I for interesting, N for novel, and E for ethical, okay? So the question should uh, deal with, should be relevant, okay, to our circumstances. Um, in this case, I would have even put in here, you know, relevant to what we are doing at safer spaces or what we want to do with safer spaces, okay? That is our topic at hand. Okay, it should be relevant to the scientific community, to those who delve into addressing these issues. Okay, so meaning that uh, it should be addressing uh, uh, some gap, okay, in the knowledge in that sense. But at the same time, it could be a question that actually opens up a new avenue for other studies to be done. Um, feasibility, again, is key. Remember, I mentioned this also with regards to the problem. Okay, it is something that you can be able to do is, um, both from your own expertise or from the resources and the time that you have. Um, it is interesting. It is something that would intrigue, you know, um, the reader. Okay, um, something that is new, uh, something that is novel, you know, um, is, is always a good start as opposed to where you have a question. Remember the not done in here thing that we're talking about, where you have a question that is simply replicative in nature, okay? Uh, has been done elsewhere. The only new thing you're telling us that has not been done in here, okay? And then again, of course, um, it needs to be, uh, to be an ethical question. Now, if we move from that, okay, a core part of our Another core part of our research proposals and our research writing should be our hypothesis, our theory. So we have the question, all right? But even as we have the question, one would want to have an idea of how you want to approach answering that question. And it is for this reason that in the research proposal, somebody like me reviewing it would be very interested in the theory or the logic behind it, okay? So you, you need to have some kind of idea. If you are interested in finding out um, whether, like in, the, in what we, uh, my team has proposed to study, um, whether actually you know, fear and fear mongering does become institutionalized over time, okay, then we need to base that on some kind of a theory. We need to have a logic as to why you know, uh, we would think that things, you know, can match up in this way, okay? And so in that sense, we draw on theory and we present certain things we would say, you know, which eventually you will see uh, 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 somewhere, you know, in the research question and the conceptual framework. You know, uh, uh, we draw on, because we are talking about institutionalization, so we'll draw from institutional theory. You know, uh, we can draw from any of its arms, Okay, uh, talk about fear work, uh, talk about, uh, you know, institutional entrepreneurship and stuff like that, okay? But there is a logic to our argument. There is, there's a reasoning behind why we would think that using the lens of institutional theory to study something like this actually makes sense, okay? Now, 
The basic thing with this uh, complex slide that I wanted to drive across is that with this much variety, it is important for us to know or to remember that certain methods lend themselves better to certain questions. Okay? So it is the question, you know, to a large extent determines the research design and the methodology that we will employ. So for example, you're dealing with something new where you do not know, you know, the factors that contribute to it. You do not know how things relate inside there, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Then qualitative methods are perfect for that, okay? When you are dealing with something where, you know, um, uh, some element of facts are reasonably known around it. And so you want to determine more or less the how much, you know, the what, the stuff like that. Then it is much easier. Okay, the most appropriate method, not that it's much easier, the most appropriate method for you there would be quantitative. Now, mixed methods, okay, are used in situations where each of these bodies independently does not give you a complete answer. Okay, so I will use a mixed methods where the research question is such that if I used only qualitative techniques, I will not necessarily get what I need to do. So I may, you know, employ, you know, in an exploratory way, I could be able to start with the qualitative data, okay? And once with the qualitative data, with the interviews and the conversations and the focus groups, you know, uh, the narrations, the observations, all that, uh, you know, once I have gotten a good sense of how, what is important and how they relate, then I move from there to doing quantitative, okay, counts. And in this way, these two actually reinforce each other. They support each other, okay? Uh, and they support me in terms of being able to, to answer. So what should guide with all this uh, mix up? you know, paradigm, call them, uh, a key factor that guides which one you choose is the problem and the question. Of course, uh, other smaller factors would be, you know, uh, the audience that you're writing to. Remember, uh, Gala gave us, uh, uh, mentioned this when he said that, uh, you know, you will be writing books and even when you're writing book, like books, and then there are books for general reading, um, you could be writing a research paper, it could be a policy piece, it could be a best practice, it could be whatever, you know. So we, you know, um, these audiences also may have their preferences. Eh? Um, even if it is academic writing, there are journals that lean heavily towards quantitative and uh, not too much on the qualitative side, you know. So you sort of like have to uh, uh, bear that in mind. Okay, your outlet and the consumer, okay, of your product. That that also is kind of, uh, but it is a secondary consideration after the major and the primary consideration, which is the research problem and then the research question. And then, of course, we are human beings. So whatever I'm comfortable in, my own training, my own background, you know, um, I am likely to be biased to use... <laughs> certain methods uh, more than others, okay? Now, um, I've talked too much on one slide and we need to move on. So, that being said, the first part, we've been dealing with how we see things. But then, the person who's receiving this research proposal from us, what exactly are they looking for, okay? Are they seeing the world the way we are seeing it? Mm, me, yes to a large extent. However, there are slight variations in terms of the kind of questions that they ask themselves, all right? And so um, I, I lifted this from the writings of, uh, of uh, a professor in Harvard. Um, uh, I think the name is Wright. Yeah, right, right. I believe, yeah, it should be right, okay? And this was presented during a discussion that we had uh, on how to review, uh, how to review papers. So, um, the person who's seated in there, when uh, uh, Katya and Barrett will be receiving our proposals or our ideas, 
uh, for the research that we intend to do in this region, okay, on unarmed civilian protection. Uh, I want to believe that they will be asking themselves these very same questions. Number one, whatever we are presenting, is it, does it give us anything new? Okay, um, will it lead us to, you know, uh, answering interesting uh, questions, interesting gaps in our knowledge in this area? Of course, with the limited resources that they have, if this is a yes, we already have a foot into the door. Okay, but if it is simply a replication study, okay, or uh, one that is just adding, you know, empirical evidence to what we know, uh, and they have few resources, they would much rather go for the previous one. That is more original. Number two, does our presentation, our proposal, does it show that we are cognizant of the issues in the field, that we understand the context? Okay, that we understand the uh, uh, dominant arguments, okay, uh, in the field regarding that which we want to study. Okay, um, and they will be looking at some of the uh, things we have quoted. Eh? They will be looking at the recent literature and they'll also be looking at seminal literature. They'll also be looking at our theory, whether there's any argument, uh, our, whether our argument rather holds what. Okay, the third thing that they will be probably be interested in um, would be uh, what I've just mentioned last. And that is, you know, how do we intend to approach this? Does it make sense? Okay, uh, the methodology that we are choosing, we are biased, for example, towards uh, participatory methods of uh, data collection. Are we aware of this? Is there any way in which the study we are proposing is going to align itself to that? And if it doesn't, Okay, is what we're choosing appropriate or are we just writing participatory methods because we know that that is the magic word that Barrett is looking for? Okay, so those are uh, things for us to, to th think about. What else? When Katya and Barrett will be reviewing these things, okay? They will be interested in finding out whether, you know, the whatever we, we imagine will be the output of this paper, will actually contribute to something to the field of study, the academic field, but then at the same time, it will contribute something to the practitioners, meaning that uh, the findings that we have uh, will not necessarily be a part in the back or we already knew this uh, kind of, uh, we, will not lead to a we already knew this kind of reaction from the actors on the ground, but rather it is going to uh, provoke you know, fresh or new thinking, okay, um, or cause correction uh, from among the practitioners because of the utility, uh, you know, of the, of the findings, okay? And then uh, the final bit, <clears throat> which again, uh, my Siri and Gala uh, talked about, is the quality of communication, okay? How you only have one chance, to make a first impression. So you need to make that impression count, okay? This is something that we overlook a lot. But truth be told, if I'm as a reviewer, I am struggling on page one, telling mistakes with poor writing, blah, blah. I will have been biased in a negative towards you. And if a competitive process and I have to choose two proposals out of seven, even though you might have a fantastic question, you're already likely to be much more harshly, uh, you know, assessed compared to one where the language flows, okay? And so, because it is an important thing, yet we overlook it, um, I want to spend maybe another just, uh, what, maybe so two, just talking about our kind of writing. So, what do we look for, okay? Text, please, not all text is the same, okay? I know there are many funky things when you go to MS Word, you know, you sort of like have to scroll for ages to get one and uh, we prefer, you know, we use, I don't know what kind of things and scroll the kind of things. Um, those texts are either easy or difficult to read, eh? 
So it is the main reason why uh, Times New Roman uh, has been the favorite for a very long time. You have a few others, Arial, et cetera, et cetera. Don't make the font size too small. Uh, please make sure that you give adequate spacing so that it's not tiring, tiring to read. Find out, okay, on whether um, there's an expectation or justification or for alignment, okay? Create good margins, okay? Make sure that you number everything in a way that makes sense so that if I want to do a quick referral uh, to any image, uh, any framework, you know, any diagram, any photograph, you know, um, I'm able to do so with ease. On the sentence structure, and I really thank um, uh, Ngala for having introduced this, okay? Um, <laughs> I, I, I was sort of wondering whether I should talk about this or maybe delete it because he mentioned it, but I really love uh, this thing here by Gary Provost, you know? Because uh, he puts it so well in, 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 in this bit. So allow me to redefine it, you know? So he says, this sentence has five words. Here are five more words. Five word sentences are fine, but several together become monotonous. Listen to what is happening. The writing is getting boring. The sound of it drones. It is like a stack record. The ear demands variety. Listen. I vary the sentence length and I create music. Music. The writing sings. It has a pleasant rhythm, a lilt, a harmony. I use short sentences and I use second length. And sometimes when I'm certain the reader is rested, I will engage him with a sentence of considerable length, a sentence that burns with energy and builds with all the impetus of a crescendo, the roll of the drums, the crash of the cymbals, sounds that say, listen to this, it is important. So write with a combination of short, medium and long sentences. Create a sound that pleases the reader's ear. Don't just write words, write music. I couldn't have said that any better, okay? Capitalization, well, there you go. Um, it is, uh, I just draw your attention to things fall apart. That Ngala mentioned is there, is as if we spoke. Uh, spelling and uh, punctuation, okay? US and UK spellings, okay? Um, the use of parentheses, uh, quotes, and so on. Um, I felt I had to bring this because uh, I extracted this uh, one time from uh, an article, one of the few that I've written, that I had sent to a journal. Um, eventually they published it. And, uh, but what was interesting for me was uh, I had uh, how many pages of comments? Seven, 11, I cannot remember. Uh, two thirds was actually on, you know, the guy telling me when that to use a colon or a semicolon when they are appropriate to be used. <laughs> And, and how to use brackets and, uh, and uh, parentheses, uh, not parentheses, and uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, quotation marks, all right? So the people who really take this, this stuff seriously, um, then let's be sure that we, uh, we do the right thing. On the issue of quoting, you can look at this again. Uh, the idea of abbreviations, you can also look at this when we share the slide deck. But uh, in, okay, when you are presenting your document, just remember, it, is, it could be the first interaction that somebody has it. So nobody will have an opportunity to say, but I know Perit. I know she usually writes well, this must have been her off day. Okay, sometimes some of these things are coded. Okay, so the only thing that a reviewer has is your document in front of them. Okay, so simple things like language, formatting, editing, Blah, blah, blah. You know, please okay, let's keep that at the back of our mind. Now, the other thing is the timelines, okay? Normally these are uh, preset and there's a reason why they're preset. I know you already have a notice now to alerting us to conversations that need to happen or something needs to happen by the 6th and then something else by the 11th, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's important that whatever it is that we do bears the timelines uh, in mind. Now. Um, two final things, keep your team close. Most of the times when we are writing these research proposals, we are not writing uh, uh, um, individually. We probably, uh, research is a collaborative, you will probably be working in a team, okay? Uh, so have your team close. Let them know what is going on. It's not a one-time 
yang terjadi. Um, have a good understanding with them. Know that uh, you expect them to be, on the one hand, your biggest supporters, meaning that they help with the writing and uh, the conceptualization and everything. But at the same time, they should also be your biggest critics. They should be able to, you know, get themselves out of the situation and try as much as possible to interrogate, you know, play devil's advocate, ask the what if, ask the hard questions, okay? Why have you chosen this theory or this argument and not this one? Why are we doing this in what can we give for studying this in, uh, in South Sudan and not in Eritrea or Djibouti, you know, uh, and stuff like that, okay? So, and then uh, relating this to the timelines, please, uh, keep your eyes uh, on that. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, for your attention uh, along that tribe. But uh, I hope that you'll be able to that you will find this useful. And I hand this back to is it Ludovica or to Rosemary? Thank you. Thank you.